She's a pillow fluffer. Any other pillow fluffers in here? <laughs> uh, Heather Marsh uh, introduced herself to me as a pillow fluffer at one of our meetings uh, in the past few years. Heather Marsh, uh, I first met in her capacity here at Mountain View College as the Director of Development. And she worked in that capacity for almost 10 years or, or, or more. Heather left us about two years ago to take her position now with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, where she is the Senior Director of Development for the board and also the Executive Director for the Texas Higher Education Foundation. Those are just her official titles, but she's really a pillow fluffer. That comes from her work with the three of us on the Mountain View College QEP. Um, in 2010, our president at the time, Felix Zamora, pulled together a, a group of faculty and staff into a little room and said, well, I'm going to leave you now. You've got to come up with a QEP. <laughs> we, never, we, we didn't know what the QEP was. But by 2012, through two years of planning and development, uh, we submitted our proposal and I went to Heather and I said, Heather, I can't believe what you've done with this document. And she said, oh, I'm just a pillow fluffer. <laughs> and a pillow fluffer she is, and she's a very good one. She makes everything not only look good, but turn out right. And our QEP, the pen is our power, was, was selected uh, during our SACS visitation team as a national model. It wouldn't have been hap would not have been possible without the help of this wonderful lady and my close friend, Heather Marsh. Thank you so much. Okay, for anyone who doubts that I believe the pen is the power, this is the lanyard I wear every day. This is the fob that gets me into super secret places in the state government. <laughs> The lanyard is the pen is the power. This is how much Mountain View College means to me. So y'all are with me every single day. It is so great to be here today. You know, I was saying earlier, I, I do a lot of presentations around well, the nation, and it's a lot of fun, and I have a very canned presentation. I don't want to do that today. So are you guys going to go with me if we just sort of have fun and have a great conversation? Is that all right? OK. It is a true honor uh, to be here today, and uh, not only do I wear the lanyard, but a lot of folks uh, that I work with get tired of hearing about Mountain View College. And somebody actually said, now why do you talk about it so much? And I sort of said, well, first off, rude. It's what I want to talk about. And second off, the more colleges and universities that I visit around the state and around the entire nation, the more I recognize that Mountain View College is such a leader in getting student-centeredness. You all, no one needs to tell you to be student-centered. That's unique. You walk through the door every morning thinking of how you're going to serve a student that day, what you're going to do for students, and how you're going to help that student succeed. That's incredible. I, it's, it, I can't say that enough. I, I really cannot. And um, so, sorry, but it is fun uh, to be here with that. And the QEP, that was a lot of fun to develop. Just like STEM PALS, we were a nation, uh, a model for the nation. We, because of the QEP, we connected with researchers at RAND out of California. I since then have heard from researchers at Stanford. We've got a researcher at Berkeley that reached out to me. She uh, knew I was uh, working in Austin, and she heard, though, that before that, I worked at Mountain View College. And she wanted to talk about peer mentoring. We had also done something with that with our STEM PALS program, and then I mentioned the Writing Center and how there's a lot of activity from a peer perspective in the Writing Center. That is now a national model for Hispanic serving institutions around the nation. So Mountain View College, don't be surprised if they reach out to you again. When we did the QEP, it was an interesting time for Mountain View College. We all came together in a unique and different way. You had faculty, you had administrators, you had staff, you had leadership. And we also brought in other folks from the community and the industry. And that's why I put this slide up here. That is not unlike what the state of Texas did for 60 by 30 techs. 
Back in 2014, first off, the state of Texas decided that they needed a strategic plan for higher education. That is not normal. Not every state in America has a strategic plan for higher education. Number two, they decided to set some pretty bold goals. Again, that is not typical. Those states that do have strategic plans for higher education very often set the bar at a level that they know they will succeed. We, Texas, did not. We are very courageous in advancing forward. The overarching goal, of course, is by the year 2030, 60% of Texans will have earned a post-secondary credential. 2030. This is why I sort of think the state strategic plan is very similar to a QEP for the state. There is right now a huge sense of urgency in going towards our goals of 2030. Just like Dr. Grimes and I had a huge sense of urgency when we were developing the QEP. We brought in industry folks to talk to us. We brought in community leaders. I think we had uh, the president of the Texans Can Charter School and Network, which focuses on serving at-risk, high-risk youth. They were talking to us about what they needed. What did the state of Texas do in 2014? We had Woody Hunt lead the strategic planning team. We brought in industry leaders. We connected with our friends at Texas Workforce Commission almost more than we connected with Texas Education Agency. Don't tell Murat that, but it's true. Because we knew that higher education had a very direct link to the workforce. Then what did we do? Just like with the QEP, we sent goals, we sent metrics, we sent deliverables. Then what did we do? We freaked out. We looked at the calendar and we said, oh my God, when does the QEP do? Then we said, oh my gosh, when is the on-site visit going to be? Then we said, oh my gosh, Dr. Grimes, do you realize that that fifth year report is right around the corner? Where is Texas right now? Our fifth year report is right around the corner. Our 60 by 30 text plan was passed in 2015, approved by the governor. Tri-agency initiative where the K-12 commissioner, my boss, the commissioner of higher education, and the Texas Workforce Commissioners, all three of them joined together, endorsed it, even came up with a tri-agency workforce plan. And then basically, nothing against TWC, but y'all left us. Y'all stepped off to the side and then said to the higher education coordinating board folks, okay, we're gonna check back with you and see how you're doing in a few years. We're coming up on our 2020. I can't believe that as I say it. Uh, and we're coming up on essentially the state's fifth year report. A uh, few folks, and please ask me anything during this presentation, don't wait till I'm done, and I am here all day, so I'm going to walk you through a couple of websites, so grab me at lunch if you need any personal tutorials. The most common question I am ever asked when I talk about 60 by 30 text is why, for the overarching goal, did we focus on 25 to 34 year olds? Any thoughts about that? It's a yardstick for the future. We wanted the 60 by 30 text plan to not be valid and not be real for yesterday or today. Again, we wanted to really, like they did in the Green Bay Packers and in the New Orleans Saints, we needed to throw that football forward to the goalpost and look towards the future. That's why. But there are some cool kids in Texarkana, and I'm hoping technology is going to be my friend here. I might have to pop out over to the computer. Randy, is it going to bother you if I play a video? You're good? Okay. There are some cool kids in Texarkana. It's a two-minute video. This video is on my website, 60by30text.com. By the way, pull out your laptops and phones. Use that website this morning while I'm talking to you, www.60x30tx.com funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to give a consumer-friendly face of data for all of our partners in the state, whether they work in higher ed K-12 industry or they're on their local PTA board and they want to know. But Texarkana kids came up with this great video. Randy, can I do it with this? How should I do it? Hold, please. You're asking the wrong. I'm asking. Oh, I, I got it. I got it. In two seconds. By the year 2030, I will be 25 years old. Whether I want to be a nurse, a welder, a teacher, a scientist, a mechanic, a police officer, a factory worker, there's a pretty good chance that my job will require a college degree or certificate. Did you know that Texas has the 10th largest economy in the world? 
and that Texas is the nation's leader in dog creation. That means Texas needs trained workers. In fact, by 2030, 60% of Texans my age will need a college degree or certificate to fill all of those jobs. Right now, we aren't even close. In the whole state, right now, only 34% of Texans 25 and older have a college degree or certificate. We have a long way to go to reach 60%, but we can do it together. Whether that's a four-year university, a community college, or a technical school. Studies show that earning a college degree or certificate will make my life better. I'll be less likely to live in poverty or commit crimes. I'll earn more money. I'll be more likely to be healthy and live longer. Education makes our entire community a better place. It makes Texas a better place. And kids like me are critical to our state's success. If we all work together, every person, every parent, every business and community leader, we can reach this goal together. 60%. 60%. 60%. By 2030, 60% of Texans my age will have a college degree or certificate. The future of Texas depends on all of us. Okay, so that is, ladies and gentlemen, why 60 by 30 texts exist. We good? That is why 60 by 30 texts. Not only that video, but I was meeting with the commissioner uh, right around the time when I had just started, so it's about two years ago, and I had a great idea. I told him what we need for 60 by 30 texts is a mission statement. And then I sort of brazenly suggested, and do I ever have a good one? Let's steal Mountain View Colleges. I mean, borrow. So let's quickly call over the leadership there. Y'all's mission statement still remains one of the best I've ever heard. Empower people and transform communities. And here is my pitch to the commissioner. I still think it's a good idea, so I still say this whenever I do a presentation. If Texas reaches the goals of 60 by 30 Tex, Texas will be transformed because Texans will be empowered with a post-secondary credential or degree. That is my personal mission statement. I truly, truly believe that. I truly have a sense of urgency. I will tell you, I have a countdown clock in my office. How many days between now and 2030? 4,411. Ladies and gentlemen, I need your help. We need to get moving. So where are we today? We have just refreshed that website that I showed you. Again, pull out your laptops and your tablets and your phones. You will not hurt my feelings. www.60by30text.com. We just refreshed it with brand new data. That website will also provide you with electronic versions of almanacs, and I put uh, sample copies on the tables for you. So you've got it that way as well. The data is refreshed. The data is a little bit daunting. Let's start with our overarching goal. For us to reach 60 by 30 techs, the state of Texas has to improve our attainment rates for post-secondary credentials by around 1.3% every year. We're kind of holding on. So we're at 1.2%. Again, this data, you all are the very first to hear it. Well, actually, I, we, I did something Wednesday. So you all are the second to hear it. Um, but this is brand new data. We're at 1.2% this year. We're creeping up. But when you really think about it, and you're thinking of 43%-ish, and we want to get to 60, we've got an awfully long way to go. And remember, that's attainment. A lot of times when I'm talking to universities and colleges, we focus on access. Dr. Garrett taught me back in 2007. He was one of the very first people I met when I started working here at Mountain View College. And he taught me that it is not just about access, because it doesn't matter if they just enroll. It matters when they graduate. It matters when they transfer. It matters if they're struggling and we help them realize that a level one or a level two certificate could be absolutely life-changing, not just for that person, but for that person's entire family. This next set of data is a little bit concerning. When we talk about our second goal, we've got completion. So by the year 2030, our goal is, not our hope, our goal is that there will be 550,000 completions within the state of Texas that year. For us to get there, we've got to focus on separate groups. Those include our economically disadvantaged population members. Those include our Latino students, African American, and now we even have an additional concern about men. Something else I know Dr. Garrett's been working on very hard. You have paper copies of this on your tables. If it's hard for you to see these bar charts, I'm going to say it again, though. 
you can pull up this website and this data right now, 60by30text.com. You can pull up this data on that website right now, not just for the state of Texas, which I'm representing, but you can check how is Mountain View College doing. I can do this for you all individually later. How is Eastfield College doing? How is Navarro doing? How is University of Texas doing? And how are they doing when we talk about our economically disadvantaged members? Economically disadvantaged right now is the most concerning area. If you watched any of the legislative session, quick tip, you can watch those online. I always encourage it. You can also watch coordinating board meetings online. Unless I'm speaking, I encourage it. If I'm speaking, turn off. You've heard it before. Uh, you will hear our commissioner speak passionately about poverty. You will hear our commissioner explain that that's the concern right now. We don't have the answer. We're very honest about that. We've got a lot of ideas. We've got a lot of stuff happening around the state. But what we're also trying to do is go around the state to have ideas come up from our colleges, from our universities. I, at the coordinating board, everyone sort of jokes. They say, oh, it's Heather's in the room, so you know she's going to get upset if anyone says anything negative about a community college. And Heather says, that's absolutely right. Community colleges are where the most ideas happen. They are where the most fearless and courageous individuals work. I was hoping Christine was in here to hear this. I appreciate her leadership and what she does to support the faculty and staff at community colleges. I am here to tell you, I support you, but I need you. We don't have the answer. So look at those numbers. Here's what else you're going to see. And this is something a lot of people surprised at. Everyone seems to think we're doing OK on our direct high school graduation to college enrollment rate. Now I know Dr. Garrett told me and taught me it's not just access, it's success. He is right. But ladies and gentlemen, I got to have access to have success. And you can talk about the high enrollment rates, and I know Mount View College is proud of it, and you should be, but I'm going to encourage you that you're not there yet. Be proud of yourself. Push yourself to go a step further. And especially push your sister colleges to go five steps further. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not only a flat line, and I wish my stomach were as flat as this. This is nowhere on track to get us to 60 by 30 text. This is serious. I am a cheerleader for 60 by 30 text. I'm called that a lot. I am. But I also want to be a truth sayer to you. We have got to do something. Here's what's really scary when you look at our direct high school graduation to college enrollment rates. This is an anomaly if I look around the nation. If we look at other states, including California, and we're compared a lot to them, and Jonathan, if you haven't yet, you're going to want to pick up the current issue of The Economist, because I know you'd love it. There's a real interesting series there about comparing and contrasting post-secondary education, California and Texas. Obviously, remember our former state demographer said, as Texas, Steve Murdoch, as Texas goes, so goes the nation. That's true. That's true in a lot of ways and for a lot of reasons, but primarily because of our demographics. This is not common. What are we doing? I have just this last week uh, reached out to Dr. Lindsay Dougherty. Some of you may remember her. She was here at Mountain View College doing a RAND research study years ago when I worked here. I'm asking her to put together a concept paper on a research study. It's probably going to cost about a million dollars. The state does not have that money. Uh, we are trying right now, I just literally yesterday started this, to try and find some private funding for it. The Teagle Foundation, the commissioner uh, was at the Carnegie Corporation in New York City Tuesday of this week saying we've got a night, we've got a problem, and we've got an idea. So we're trying to put some research behind this to say, is it because Middle End Texas is doing well in the oil fields? Are they going there right after high school graduation? Is it because we're not communicating the value of a post-secondary credential well enough? Is it because nationwide people are talking about post-secondary attainment in a different way and starting to doubt the efficacy of that credential and that post-secondary degree? What do we need to do to counteract that? I'm going to try and end my presentation early today because this is the group that will help me figure out that answer. And if not today, 
although I know Mount View College is great at Socratic dialogue, so I know that's gonna happen. But if not today, reach out to me at any time. I've got an idea. Heather, I was just at a high school and the principal said, blah. Heather, I was just with my uh, grandchild's PTA and this is what I heard. We've got to do something. There are a lot of little programs happening. There are a lot of individual initiatives happening. In the state of Texas, one of the things I was happy with this last legislative session, uh, they did give us another two million for Advise Texas. Does everyone here know what that is? Advise Texas is based off of the uh, advising core out of North Carolina developed by Nicole. She met with the commissioner, it was right uh, before I started, said she wanted that model in Texas. Um, we, the commissioner said we don't do your model because that's North Carolina, so we're gonna have to make it our model and turn it into Advise Texas, which we did. That model is based on taking a very high performing baccalaureate granting institutions, recent college, they had to have graduated in May, go through nine weeks of training in the summer, after that nine weeks of training, they are assigned to one of the highest risk high schools in the state of Texas, and they work directly with the juniors and seniors, not just to fill out their FAFSA, not just to fill out Apply Texas and apply to higher education, but they work with the families. They work with them to escort them through right up to the first day of college. Here's another challenge. We're finding a lot of what's called summer melt happening. I will say what this stat will not tell you, and again, pull up that stat just for your region, your county, or your institution on 60by30text.com. I will say that uh, the state of Texas does not have an application problem. We've got a lot of seniors around this state, Dr. Garrett, that are doing their FAFSA and are doing their college applications. Let's look at one of our HBCUs in the state of Texas, Texas Southern University. Nearly 50% of the students who apply and are accepted never show up on the first day. I know, nearly 50%. And that's an HBCU, I give that as an example because HBCUs, much like HSIs, have a great reputation, and it's a well-deserved one, and it's a research-proven one, of really mentoring and working with the students. So Advise Texas, our four universities in the state of Texas that are Advise Texas Institution, uh, University of Texas, Texas A&M, uh, Trinity, and uh, just down the road, Texas Christian University. Matt is the director of the Advise Texas program at TCU. Um, we also have a private funding that goes to that, the foundation that I represent, Texas Higher Education Foundation. That board is very invested to make sure that they get a lot of extra resources. But they can only do so much. We have 112 advised Texas advisors in the state of Texas serving 112 of the highest high-risk high schools. That's not gonna improve that rate. That's gonna improve the lives of individuals and families. I need something bigger, I need something bolder, and I need something larger, or again, ladies and gentlemen, we are not gonna hit 60 by 30 techs. Last two goals of 60 by 30 techs, marketable skills and student debt, Texas Workforce Commission. If you hear anything more about marketable skills, your eyes are just gonna roll in the back of your head. My challenge with marketable skills is that people just assume it's over here, yes, it's critical thinking. My challenge, ladies and gentlemen, with marketable skills, especially in academia, is because I worked with you during SAC COC visits. I understand accreditation. I know that you're focused on student learning outcomes. And I know, especially at this college, that you take it five steps further. You're, law, you're talking about program outcomes. You're talking about what they're doing five years after they've attained their credential or their associate's degree. I know you all are doing that. But marketable skills goes much deeper than that. Not everybody is a faculty member at Mountain View College. Not everybody cares as much as you care. Some faculty members deliver a curriculum in such a way that it's pure and authentic to them, and they never take that extra step to help the student connect it with what that student will do when they leave the classroom. How do I encourage those faculty members to think about that? 
We know writing is a marketable skill. We know critical thinking is a marketable skill. How can that faculty member prove that? And then how can that institution embrace that? There's some neat stuff happening, I gotta tell you, around the state. Um, I think it's Sam Houston State, but I'll, I'd have to check myself on this. They're doing a soft, they're modeling what's called a soft transcript. So you've got your legitimate transcript. Hi, I'm Jane Doe. I made a C in Dr. Grimes' class. I made a B in Professor Kroll's class, and I, my GPA is a 3.4. Okay. What about a soft transcript? Hi, I'm Jane Doe. People say that I work well on a team. People say that I can fluff the pillows, that I can take something incredible that Dr. Wright and Dr. Grimes gave me, and I can make it pretty, I can make it accessible, I can make it consumer friendly, which is what I try to do with 60by30text.com. Y'all are getting tired of hearing that, right? Happy hour tonight, make that your drinking game, 60by30text.com. I'm just saying. But how, so that, that I, I think that's sort of interesting. So they're modeling that. So when the student graduates from Sam Houston, they're able to clearly articulate that when they go for their first job. So it's not just something that's dependent on the career services office. Because let's be honest, that's one of the busiest offices on campus, especially at community colleges. I talk about that a lot too. We can't ask the same director who handles career services, who is also your Title IX representative, and who also does about, what, nine other things, Dr. Garrett, we can't have them be solely responsible to help Jane Doe understand that what she learned in Dr. Grimes' class will absolutely help her become the next VP at ExxonMobil, will absolutely help her work an assembly line on Amazon, will absolutely help her fulfill whatever it is she wants to do when she leaves our institutions. Student debt, we are holding where we should be which means uh, we want it to be a small percentage of your first year wages. Texas is doing very good in that. Dallas County is doing exceptional with that. I applaud the low tuition, still 59, a credit hour, I believe. I, I applaud that. That certainly helps, but we need to do a better job communicating that as well. Not everybody, by the way, is doing as well as Dallas County. Uh, again, 60by30text.com, you can pull up uh, the data for student debt by region. K-12 region, uh, which is new. I just did that in our phase two update. I had to get some additional <laughs> donations to cover that uh, because so many people align everything with the K-12 region instead of our higher ed region. Honestly, I'll pause there. So many higher ed professionals in Texas don't even know there are higher education regions. Professor York, I know you do. There are 10 in the state. There are 20 uh, K-12 regions, and there are, I think, 85 TWC regions, depending on which commissioner I'm talking to. Sorry, Lori. No, nothing, nothing but love for TWC. You know that. You know that. Uh, but pull, pull up that information. So what are we doing? When I talk about student debt, I want to highlight emergency aid. I've personally become passionate about this because I personally, uh, and Dr. Garrett, you did not know you'd be talked about so much this morning. I personally was with Dr. Garrett when we knew we had a homeless student. Uh, I was one of the things I'm proud of uh, that I did during my time here at Mountain View College is when we shifted away from the standard SECC state employee charitable contribution model and brought it in district uh, to the foundation. Dr. Garrett, his first idea, and I was able to help make it happen, it was not my idea, I give him all the credit, Heather, we've got to help the students who can't afford their regalia when they graduate. They have worked so hard to get to graduation. How, do we, how can we help them buy their robe and their cap? They can't afford it. He was pulling money out of his own pocket left and right helping students. A lot of us were. That's the culture of Mountain View College. That is not the culture at every university and college in Texas. So what are we doing? Well, for emergency aid, uh, what we've done is we've tried to highlight the need. It's not just food insecurity, but it is. It's not just housing insecurity needs, but it is. What can universities do? Why are you so focused on a $10 parking fine? Why are you so focused on uh, a textbook fine or a library fine? Can we waive those fines? Why is that gonna stop Jane Doe from getting her bachelor's degree at UT? 
Why should a $50 textbook fine prevent her, the very first in her family to graduate, the very first probably in her neighborhood to graduate? And uh, let me think about UTRGV right now. I was just there last week. Why should that prevent her from walking the stage? And why should that prevent that family from celebrating? We're starting those conversations, and they're not always easy. If you go to 60by30text.com and you do a backslash, EA programs, you're going to see an 80-page report on emergency aid. I hosted a party last August in Austin, bringing folks together, learning what, uh, I remembering what Dr. Grimes taught me and how you bring in this diverse group of folks and have that Socratic dialogue about how we can move the ball forward. They came in, we brought in Tim Rennick from Georgia, he's doing some amazing things. Sarah Goldrick Rabb was uh, in town, still is quite a bit. And we started those conversations about what we can do. Since then, we've got 13 institutions in the state of Texas that have started a, uh, it's, not a it's not a scholarship, it's not a grant. This does not impose at all on Title IV financial aid. But what they do is an emergency grant program. If a student can't pay their utility bill, they can go to a certain office. They can say, I need help. I have no air conditioning, I have no electricity, and a finals are next week. And that institution will give them $200. There's one institution that's worked out a special partnership with the utility company. I think this is amazing. I even, I, I had a small role in that where, you know, I'm a network broker, right? I'm a relationship broker, so I'm bringing the people together. And I had a small role in that, and I'm so proud that everyone came together. So what the utility company is doing is decreasing when there's an issue by about 50%. And then the college is able to cut a check, not to the student because there was a concern of what would happen, directly to the utility company. What does that mean? The student can power up their computer when they get home and do their homework. They can finish up that essay, Dr. York. They can, they can move that ball forward. Tab. Also near and dear to my heart, I, I've started to become like a mom in Texas where I have these programs and I'm going to need to stop saying which is my favorite because you know we love them all. Texas Affordable Baccalaureate, one of the first big gets I had when I started with the state was a million dollar grant from uh, the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. Uh, it was the largest in the state's history and I say that not because I'm proud of what I did. I'm proud of the Dell Foundation, a Texas family stepping up to help Texas families. Texas Affordable Baccalaureate means that we have institutions in the state of Texas who said, we promise to take one degree program that exists, one, we will retrofit it to cost less than half of a traditional bachelor's degree and it will take a student three years or less. We did not mandate how they do that, but we provided a lot of tips. Competency-based education is huge. Prior learning assessment is huge. Sound a little bit like a politician here, not trying to. But with competency-based education, I need to watch my time, make sure I don't steal from TWC. With competency-based education, with prior learning assessment, and with some incredible faculty members who I have just become great friends with around the state, they've done it. They're excited to do it. Some of our leading TAB institutions, uh, South Texas College, which was one of the very first community colleges to be allowed to offer a baccalaureate degree. One of our most recent TAB institutions, which I'm super proud of, just down the road, University of North Texas, Dallas. President Mong was, was uh, gracious enough to meet with the commissioner and myself. President Wong was gracious enough to walk down the hall, literally, and said, Heather, I think you need to meet Eric. Eric, Dr. Coleman at UNT Dallas, was gracious enough, courageous enough, and fabulous enough to say, oh my god, have I got a great idea. We've got a lot of first responders in Dallas County who have some college credit but have never gotten their college degree. In the Dallas Fire Department alone, nearly 70% of the employees had college hours and no degree. So what did he do? He developed the first Texas Affordable Baccalaureate program focused on first responders. What industry liaison was he able to get? The Dallas fire chief retired, 
who during the Czech presentation, uh, this was in February this year, during the Czech presentation choked up and gave the story of how he had been in and out and out and in, not saying anything negative about Tarrant County College, this is just his quote of Tarrant County College, for a span of time of 11 years. He was working up through the ranks at the time, working through the Dallas Fire Department. He had four kids. He wanted his four kids to know that their dad was a college graduate. He also knew that he could support those four kids with more money because when he got a bachelor's degree, he was able to elevate higher within the Dallas Fire Department. At that time, he had no intention of becoming the Dallas Fire Chief. Tarrant County College, he kept trying to sort of do this little lurching thing. Somebody said, you know what you should do? You should go down the road to Dallas Baptist University. I'm also a fan, by the way, of our private institutions. We call them ICUTs, the independent colleges and universities in our great state of Texas. Dallas Baptist University did what Mountain View College does every day. They had an advisor who said, I don't care how long the line is, I will spend time with you. We will map this out. Dallas Baptist University spent three and a half hours with this gentleman. Dallas Baptist University got his bachelor's degree, worked with him, and he was able to get it in less than two years. Finally, he got his bachelor's degree. Ladies and gentlemen, that's life changing. And then that he is now working with Eric at UNT Dallas, Dr. Coleman, sorry, that he's now working with Dr. Coleman at UNT Dallas to say, let's make this where it's not just somebody is lucky and they hit that fabulous advisor at Mountain View College or that awesome advisor at Dallas Baptist University. Let's standardize this. Let's make this where it's accepted. Let's make this Texas's new normal. Another thing we're doing is open educational resources. If you followed our legislative session, you know that our uh, senators were very kind and representatives in giving us 250,000 to create a repository. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a clear result of the TAB programs that have started around the state. Because a lot of what's happening with competency-based education Online learning is not the platform that it was in the 80s and the 90s. For open educational resources, what else is that doing? If it's a typical, traditional class, that means I, Jane Doe student, don't have to spend $450 on a biology textbook that I'm only gonna use for three months. That means when I start summer session one, I'm gonna use this textbook for how many days? I don't have to shell out that much cash for a textbook. What are we doing with open educational resources? Uh, I've become very, very close with the executive director of the Virtual College of Texas. She's very close with the community colleges of Texas. You can see why we got along. Judith uh, uh, helped us fund a survey that we did this past spring for the entire state. It's a landscape analysis. We needed to get our hands around what we're doing on open educational resources in the state. This follows up with the July 2018 report that we presented before the coordinating board. We're gonna showcase the results of that survey in August, I hope you'll join me. Go to 60by30text.com backslash OER to register or just come on in. And even if you can't make that convening, watch the 60by30text.com website. I'll be putting the report on there as soon as I launch it at the convening. Everyone knows what open educational resources is, right? Okay, because I had to check myself. Sometimes I get into that higher education acronym stuff. Legislature, uh, Professor York can tell you way more about this than me. We did have 522 bills that my uh, folks in my building were analyzing as soon as the session started, right up until May 27th when it ended. 101 passed. Generally, we are saying that higher education held flat and it was a very safe uh, legislative session for us. We didn't hit any huge hiccups. We also didn't hit any huge wins. The commissioner and I are in complete agreement on this. We needed to get performance-based funding uh, implemented for universities. I'm an advocate for that. It's, it's almost a personal advocacy. I was here at Mountain View College when it was implemented at community colleges. I think it changes the conversation the way Dr. Garrett helped me see it needed to be changed in 2007. It's not just access, it's success. So great, if we do this QEP right to work, how is it gonna help a student graduate? All of a sudden, every conversation tipped to that. I think that needs to happen at our universities. I'm very happy with Senate Bill 25. Again, Dr. Garrett should be happy with this as well. That will force our universities to document 
when they don't accept transfer credit and apply it towards a degree. What happens when you leave a community college and you want to go to a university? Everything transfers. Everything transfers. Students will tell you, but not everything applies to the degree. And what is that usually dependent on? An advisor. And who are usually paid the least amount at universities? Advisors. The only way we were going to move that needle is legislatively. Now here's what's fun, and this is what, I'm sorry I chatted so long, but this is what I want to get to, is what are you doing right to work? This top two italicized lines there, uh, so as you know, I serve dual roles. I'm, with, I'm a state employee, but I also uh, have the absolute privilege of serving as the executive director for the Texas Higher Education Foundation. I have the privilege of serving in that role because of who the trustees are. I've got Elaine Mendoza. She's chair of the Board of Regents for Texas A&M University System. She is the first Latina to be the chair of the Board of Regents for Texas A&M. I have Woody Hunt. I have Daryl Heath. So I'm chatting with them, and they said, so where are you going Friday? Because they were trying to set up something else. And I said, yeah, no, that's a hard pass. That's been on the calendar for a while. Don't even ask. I'm going to be at Mountain View College. Well, what are you doing? I'll go right to work, QEP. I actually shared the QEP with them. Woody Hunt said, Dr. Grimes, eye contact here, this matters. He then asked the question to the trustees, why does writing matter? That first bullet blew me away. It wasn't, I need my employees to communicate. We know that. I'm not saying that that's a low threshold. I get it. It wasn't Heather email is, you know, it, it wasn't all of that which we know and which we agree with. It's Heather, when I interview somebody and they are a good writer, it tells me that they care. They are courteous. They care to communicate effectively the first time. They care that Dr. Grimes doesn't have to read a sentence five times to figure out what was Heather really trying to say? And they want to hire that person that cares. That absolutely blew me away. I think we need to bring that up as we talk about the importance of writing. Relationship building. I'm a fundraiser, I'm a network broker, I, I, I bring people together. So relationship building to me, I'm hardwired to understand it. Not everyone is. And what our employers around the state, and Lori, catch me on this if you disagree, are finding is that whether you're working at the plant in San Marcos for Amazon, General Motors plant in Arlington, or you're working in ExxonMobil in their public relations department, relationships matter. And what's the key facet to developing a good relationship? the ability to write and communicate. Because very often in today's global economy, and remember 60 by 30 texts, Woody Hunt made sure in 2014 that that plan was very focused not just on Texas economy, but on our global economy because we know it's all interconnected. And in that global economy, how do you develop those relationships? It's not usually on the phone. It's usually email. And how can I develop that relationship the best way? By communicating well. I also love the stat I pulled down there below for you, Dr. Grimes. So, so take it and run with it. I know this sort of, I think, reflects what Lori's going to talk to you about. Uh, we know that writing is the most important soft skill. We now can say, according to the College Board, two-thirds of salaried workers, they require writing. That takes it beyond your first italicized bullet of courtesy. But again, that kind of blew me away. Okay, 60by30text.com. I was going to walk you through the website. I am absolutely here all day, so I will do that uh, even uh, whenever you want. I brought my laptop. Make sure you are comfortable in using that website. Make sure you go to the goal pages on that website and you see how your region is doing, your county is doing, your K-12 region is doing, your institution is doing. I implore you, whether you are in your faculty association meetings, whether you, Dr. Garrett, are in President's Cabinet, I implore you, have these hard conversations. I implore you, when folks say we need to spend some money on XYZ, 
say, how is that going to help our completion rate? Because at Mountain View College, our economically disadvantaged numbers aren't looking great. They may be looking great. I'm not saying that. But I implore you to have these hard conversations. When they happen in your faculty meetings, when they happen in the President's Cabinet, that's when people will start to have the ideas, especially at our community colleges around the state of Texas. So questions, conversation, discussion prompts? I've got a few minutes. OK, can I give myself a moment of pride that I stayed at the podium? <laughs> You know, Randy's pretty tough, so I, 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 I don't want to upset Dr. Grimes. I don't want to upset Randy. I mean, I know these folks, and they know where I live. I've really got to be on my best behavior. What are your thoughts on 60 by 30 texts? You know, I should have done pigeonhole. Um, uh, for those who aren't aware of it, I, I just bought a license for the foundation, so I'm, I'm fine to, to help you guys with that in presentations. It's a way for introverts, and, and Professor York taught me about that years and years ago from that great book he read. It's a way to engage introverts in, in different dynamic conversations. Remind me, I need to show that to you. Are you guys all in on 60 by 30 text? Do you get how student-centered it is? Dr. Grimes? What is the state's what is the state's plan B? We do not have one. The state of Texas does not fail. Next question. <laughs> yes, Professor Story. We are currently, I, in the current projections, that we are going to achieve the goals. Um, I know that your job is to say yes, but you think right now, with the progress that we are making, you think that we will achieve the goals. Do you think that there's going to be something drastic? Yeah, we're going to need some drastic. You know, I've got a lot of colleagues who they would say, yes, Professor, it is my job to tell you that we're going to make it. And it is. But I, I'm able, because I wear two hats, I can represent the foundation or the state, and I can keep it real with you. Because I do the 60by30text.com website, and I see the data as it's loaded up, I can be real with you. We are going to have to have some tough conversations. We're had, we had them during the last legislative session. The commissioner is having them every day with our universities. And not just, you know, and I say universities because it seems whenever we're about, and maybe this is just my own personal prejudice that I love community colleges, but it seems that you guys do get it. And I think that's because you see, the, you, you see it from a real perspective, uh, and then you feel the successes. So, personally when you have them so you're, you're able to track it really well I will say again I am personally mystified and scared of the direct high school graduation to college enrollment rate I don't get it I was surprised I thought we were better than that I thought the needle was gonna move the needle is not moving five hundred and fifty thousand high school graduates last May never in Texas never went to college that fall anywhere anywhere do you think that's because we're in a pretty good economy right now I don't see the yeah people. I can get a job without the question was do you think it's because of the economy we don't know. It certainly is being, a, that's a hypothesis that's out there. That's why I think we need a research study. We just concluded by just, I mean, December 2018, it nearly killed me. We just concluded a million dollar study on dual credit. Because remember with House Bill 5 and all the other stuff, all of a sudden dual credit was talked about a lot. Where are we going with this? And some wise folks said, let's take a step back and huge study. Let's have it have a cost uh, effectiveness. Let's have it talk about readiness, et cetera, et cetera. That resulted in, in the mandate that you have to have a degree plan filed, part of this last legislative session. I, it may have to do with the economy. I don't know. I think there needs to be a research study. Yes, sir? We don't. Uh, we're going to start working closer with TWC on this. When I talk about that study, we're going to be engaging with them. As a matter of fact, um, I know the commissioner is meeting with Commissioner Marath, our K-12 uh, commissioner, Monday, I think it is. 
And then the next step is he and uh, Commissioner Paredes uh, Marath and um, two of the three of the commissioners at TWC, they usually get together once a month at lunch. They have a very private, confidential gathering, and they talk about stuff like this. That's going to be talked about. It's the next topic of conversation. Um, we are trying to do a better job at tracking data out of state as well. Um, thankfully, this last legislative session, we will have funding to connect to the National Center for Education Statistics at a higher level. So Iva and her team here will be able to give you uh, other data. But I, 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 the, just the bare bones of that, 550,000, seeing that flat line. And again, when we talk about this, and I know you're, as you should, you're hearing me from a Dallas County perspective. But for me, I'm talking from a state perspective. And yes, I know Midlands, okay, Laura, yeah, I'd love for you. Uh, and, but what's happening down in the valley? I'm really worried about East Texas. You know those kids from Texarkana? I'm really worried about them. There's not a lot of industry there to go to. So we're pretty confident that if they are working right after high school graduation, it is not in a job that's going to propel them into the middle class. Ladies and gentlemen, it is 10.01, so I am at the end of my time. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. One more round of applause for everyone.